Welcome to the Christian Church on this Sunday afternoon, September the 7th, 2014. I thank God for another opportunity to preach the gospel right here in my home. I thank God for his goodness. I thank God for his grace and his kindness. And he's been so merciful to us. I thank God for allowing me to be able to really concentrate strongly on doctrine this year of 2014. We've been contending for the faith. We've been dealing with doctrinal issues that have been, you know, talked about and disputed for thousands of years. People have always wanted to have varying opinions about who God is, mm -hmm. but we know that our God is the God of the universe, and we know that our God is more unique than any other God because he functions as a holy trinity. It is three in one. And we clearly express that and explain that in a two-part series earlier. It's not God playing three different roles, but it is three distinct persons that equal one triune Godhead. That is the God that we serve. Anyone that believes differently from that is not teaching you sound Christian doctrine. You understand? We have to separate real Christianity from the counterfeit. And there are many people that claim to believe in the Trinity, but they blow it in other areas. See, we got to get this thing right in every area, and we can only do that with the help of the Holy Spirit because the Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. That means we don't have it all, but when we trust in the one who does have it all, we can have sound doctrine that is without reproof or reproach and is error-free, and it's by God's power, not ours. When we depend on the power of the Holy Spirit, we end up in agreement. There's so much difference disagreement, division, and discord going on from those people calling themselves the body of Christ. But when the Holy Spirit gets involved, he brings unity, he brings agreement, and he brings order. Amen? And we're talking about biblical order because we know that the devil tries to mock what God does. See, even the devil's kingdom is organized. It has a certain order and rank to it, trying to mimic what God has already established. But we know that God's kingdom is the supreme kingdom that will last forever. Amen. The devil's kingdom is going to be destroyed. But the kingdom of God will endure forever, and the word of God will endure forever. And now we're in a place where we're talking about establishing the fact that God has already preserved his word and that his word is absolutely true. And there have been many sermons that I preach using scriptures I could have used in this series. But the word is so powerful, we can find other passages of scripture to bear witness to the truth. So we're going to continue. We just came off of dealing with the book of talking about the integrity that man is supposed to have and women and their children are supposed to have in a godly home and the fact that a man's home is his ministry and that God was looking for people who were faithful. The Apostle Paul, who was inspired of God, told Timothy to commit the gospel to faithful men, not to unfaithful men. He told him to ordain bishops and elders in every church those who are of an upright character, you understand? Not people who are constantly blowing in and playing spiritual and religious games, but people who are serious about their God, serious enough to have character, serious enough to have honesty and integrity and in obeying what the gospel says, not doing what they want and using excuses and saying, well, we all fall short. That is not an excuse on the day of judgment. Nobody's perfect. Not an excuse on the day of judgment. Because the Bible says in Matthew's chapter number 5 and verse 48, Jesus said, therefore be ye perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So there's a human perfection that God wants us to get to. It doesn't make us absolutely perfect. It doesn't make us flawless where our blood could have taken away the sins of the world. That's why Jesus came. But there's a level of 
of growth where God says in his eyes he sees you as being perfect as it relates to being perfectly placed in his will you understand and now we are here and we're talking about the word of God we know that based on the evidence that's out there in the, in the comparison of scriptures that God's word is fully contained in the King James Bible but there were some other things that needed to be removed so that we could concentrate fully on the inspired word, like taking the apocrypha out, like correcting some spelling and grammatical errors that occurred, and having a pure text, which we established that pure text is contained in the pure Cambridge edition of the scriptures. And we can't find that Bible in any store. Walmart, Target, all those places, they sell uh, Bibles that say they're KJV, but they come from companies that they themselves have also made some, done some things that they shouldn't have done. And it's less scripture that's changed, but nevertheless, there are some scriptures that are changed in some areas that you really have to know what you're looking for in order to find them. But, you know, we still have God's word, you know, and eventually, Lord willing, I will have a pure Cambridge edition of Bible that I could actually open up and read. For now, I have it. We have it downloaded on, on our smartphone and we have a free PDF document that is downloaded that you can get on the Internet. If you search it out, Pure Cambridge Edition of the King James Bible, and there are websites that will allow you to freely download the true scriptures, and you can compare them to whatever Bible you have. You know? So we can have the true word of God and test everything according to what is true. Mm -hmm. God has given us a true text here for the English speaking people and for the people all over the world. If you allow the Holy Ghost to lead you, he'll lead you and guide you in all truth. So you'll know the truth and there'll be no excuse for you on the day of judgment. Today we're going to start in Psalm 32. We're going to be in Psalm 119 as well. We'll see what we're able to to get through today. And if I feel this, you know, it's enough, then we'll pick it up next week. But we're going to delve into the truth of the word of God. Psalm 31 says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Verse 2 says, Bow thou thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privately for me. For thou art my strength. Verse 5, into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. We'll start off with these first five verses. They bring glory to God. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. I should never be ashamed for standing up for the truth of the gospel. I should never be ashamed for standing up and saying that the churches are in error when they take you to phony Bibles that twist and counterfeit the word. I can stand up and be unashamed and say I'd rather preach the gospel in my home than take my family somewhere where they're going to be perverted spiritually because they're teaching and preaching out of Bibles that have blasphemed the name of the Lord and yet they're calling them Bibles. Do you understand? It is not the Bible that saves you. It's the Word of God that saves you. So anybody can call their book a Bible because Bible simply means book. But when you're 
talking about the word of God. You're talking about the promises that came from Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You're talking about the true inspired word of God. When the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction. You understand it's profitable for reproof. For instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be fully equipped. You understand? The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished under all good works by the inspired word of God. Amen? Amen. 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 God's word is true. Doesn't matter how many people say amen or not. It's still true. God's word is awesome. David was speaking here, and when we get to verse 5, there's a prophecy here that was fulfilled by Jesus at the cross. When Jesus said, Father, into thine hand, I commit my spirit. This is some powerful, powerful scripture. Verse 2 says, bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily, be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. That means God has the power to take care of his people. He's able to save you when adversity comes. He's able to save you when danger is lurking. You understand? Because the enemy doesn't take too fond of Christians. He hates them. But God loves me. And so since God loves me, doesn't matter who hates me. Doesn't matter who wants to kill me. Doesn't matter who threatens me. The power of God, the presence of the Almighty God is able to save me and deliver me out of the hands of my enemies. Amen. God is all that. And then some. Because he's more than enough. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> God is already here. We sang that song. Can't you feel his presence? See, people are looking for God's presence to come. God was here before you got here, and he'll be here when you leave. God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. So all I have to do is open up my heart and allow the power of God to be manifest in my life. Amen. Jesus will come in. He's no respecter of persons. Verse 3, for thou art my rock and my fortress, therefore for thy name's sake lead me and guide me in the name of Jesus, not in my name or somebody else's name or some church bishop's name, but in the name of Jesus. You understand? It's in his name, for his name's sake, lead me in paths of righteousness for thy name's sake. That's the name of the Lord into thy hand. Let me see. Verse 4. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privately for me, for thou art my strength. That means God's going to protect you. God will pull me out of the net. Even though the enemy's plotting and planning against me, I know that God can protect me for his glory and not for our mind. Not so that I can boast and be proud like some of these people who think they have favor with God. But God will protect me and raise me up so I can continually can stand up and unashamedly proclaim his word. Amen. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. God, the Son, Jesus Christ had delivered me when he told the father that he committed his spirit into his hand at Calvary I was set free and I was redeemed meaning I am now valuable when at one time I was nothing and worthless Jesus has redeemed me and made me somebody in Christ I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengtheneth me amen Let's go to verse 6. It says, I have hated them that regard lying vanities, but I trust in the Lord. Meaning, you know what? I can't stand to be in the presence of people preaching false doctrine. 
victory. Can't stand being in the presence of idolatry and people following after superstars and celebrities. Even in the church, you got all these celebrities, all these people that are forming relationships based on advantage, having men's persons in favor because of advantage. As the scripture says, they only want to hang around people because they're getting uh, their videos are going viral on YouTube. You understand what I'm saying? While the truth of the gospel continues to, to get low uh, a viewage according to what the YouTube is posting. But the truth is still the truth if only three people view it. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It doesn't matter how many people view these sermons or any other sermon proclaiming the truth of the gospel. The fact is, if the truth is being proclaimed, that truth is eternal and those words will never pass away because God has preserved all of my words. You understand? And I want him to look and be pleased with what's coming out of my mouth. I don't want him to be angry at me because woe to the person that falls into the hands of the living God. It is a fearful thing, says the Bible in Hebrews 10. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You understand? Don't make God angry. Judgment's coming mm -hmm. if you do. That's why... The psalmist said in another song, correct me, Lord, but not in thine anger. You understand? God's going to correct me when I get out of line, but I don't want to do things to make him absolutely angry with me. Because I don't want to go to hell and I don't think you want to go to hell either. That's why I'm going to stand up and preach the truth. And if I'm shown to be in error, I apologize. I repent before God and then I can go and proclaim the truth. Because I want to be one speaking the truth. I don't want to be around people, even in churches and pastors, preaching false doctrine, saying things that they ought not for filthy lucre's sake, as the Bible says they would do. And they're doing it now. That's why I'm here in a place where God can use me to preach to my family and to whatever people want to come and visit. I thank God for it. But... My responsibility is to my wife and to my family. That's what God has given me the responsibility of. If someone wants to come and sit and they feel uh, that they can listen to the gospel here, it's free will. They free will come and they free will go. But I thank God for his grace that no matter who's here or who's not, God's grace has protected me and kept me. And empowering me to preach the gospel. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy. For thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul and adversities. God is there to protect me in the midst of adversity. And has not shut me up into the hand of the enemy. Thou hast set my feet in a large room. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. Mine eye is consumed with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly, for my life is spent with grief. And my years with sighing, my strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. David's feeling the pain of the fact that he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband Uriah killed and a terrible, terrible punishment came from the Lord. But yet the Lord still spared his life and because David repented, he kept his soul out of hell. You understand what I'm saying? He saved him from eternal destruction, but there was a price to pay for his sin and David is feeling the effects of the fact that he is reaping some of the things that he sowed when he was in his iniquity. But yet God still loved them, and whom the Lord loveth he correcteth, even as a father, the child in whom he delights. Verse 11, I was a reproach among all mine enemies, but especially among my neighbors. And they feared of mine acquaintance, 
They that did see me without fled from me. People were afraid of him. Everybody knew what David had did. And they saw him being punished and they fled from him. But he still, you know, he turned back to the Lord. He said, I am forgotten as a dead man. Out of mind, I am like a broken vessel. For I have heard the slander of many. Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they...